And I'm very, very pleased to have Andrea Jung here today um, joining Hi, us. Um, she's both the chairman and the chief executive of Avon Products. Um, she was appointed CEO in 1999 and chairman in, 19, in 2001. And she's been on the board of directors since 1998. She um, became CEO after, um, after uh, ascending to different senior level positions within the Avon product marketing group. And she joined uh, the company in January of 1994. Before that, she was at Neiman Marcus, uh, responsible for accessories, cosmetics, and women's, women's intimate and children's apparel. Um, she is ranked number 19 on the For Forbes list of the world's 100 most powerful women and number six on Fortune Magazine's 50 most powerful women in business list. Um, she holds a magna cum laude degree from Princeton University and she is fluent in Chinese. And the interview will not be in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'd like everyone to give a really warm welcome, please, to Andrea Jung. Thank you. Great. Now, um, she and I are going to start by asking some questions. And then afterwards, um, or during, if there's any burning questions, like please just come to the mic, you know, ask the questions. I'd like to make it as interactive as possible. Um, we are being uh, videotaped. So if you have questions, please, even if you're here, in, um, please come up to the mic so we can make sure that that's recorded. Great. Hi, everyone. How are you? Thank you for coming. Right. Okay. All right. So, um, so I learned a lot of really interesting things as I was. I thought I knew a lot about when Avon. you googled me. No. Yeah, when I googled you, um, and I looked at the website, and I thought I knew a lot about Avon, but I learned even more. Um, but one of the things that I saw is that Avon uh, is called the company of women. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting, maybe if you could just start a little bit about um, that tagline and how did that tagline? Um, what does that mean to the company? Because I saw that on all your corporate yeah, we, um, material. As a matter of fact, it was an interesting uh, discussion. I guess we actually termed the company for women in 1998 when I began. Uh, I was the president then, not yet the CEO. And there was a lot of debate because we have a lot of men at the company as well as women. And they're like, oh my god, is there room for a few good men here too? <laughs> but um, the company was founded in 1886 by a gentleman. Um, and so I guess, you know, 125 years later, no different than your company with a very prescient founder who believed that actually women should have the opportunity to work and this was before they could vote. So if you just kind of go back to the founding principle of the company uh, and the very first product we sold was earnings, independent income stream for women and it was pretty heretical. He was actually a um, encyclopedia salesman door to door. There were a few, you know, Fuller, there were a few direct sales companies, but they were all men agents selling at the time. Women didn't sell out of the home. And um, he was an encyclopedia salesman. A friend of his gave him a perfume sample to kind of go around at Christmas and give as a gift if people bought the, an entire set of encyclopedias. And what was happening is that the women who were the people at home, when he knocked on the door, were saying, we really don't want the encyclopedias. Could we just get the perfume? <laughs> so that's actually how the, the, the company began. He called it the California Perfume Company. He started his own direct sales company, and he was uh, pretty ahead of his time because he decided he was only going to hire women, and again, they couldn't even vote yet, to be his sales agents. And um, so the mission and the vision of the company really is independent earnings opportunities for women, and it started in the US. Uh, and today we have business, I guess, in 140 countries. We do particularly well, as you can imagine, sort of in the emerging and developing world where women are moving into the socioeconomic demographics where they want to have entrepreneurial jobs. Uh, we're doing extraordinarily well right now because I guess with the fear and the reality of unemployment, the more jobs that are lost, the more people we are recruiting. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We sell mostly women's products, um, but it's really kind of products for women uh, sold by women. And we like to think of ourselves actually as the original social network for women. Most people join for the affiliation and stay for the relationships, not just the products. Um, and so it was feed on the street, and uh, we're trying to evolve it, but that's what it, that's what it was 125 years ago. 
So I think that um, we were actually just talking beforehand about that being one of the um, differences between Google and Avon is Avon, Google's such a new company. Um, we're just celebrated actually our 10 year anniversary and Avon is 126 years old. Yeah. So how do you, um, what are some of the, how, how do you keep a company, how do you keep those traditions but then at the same time keep the company energized yeah, and fresh? Yeah, I think that's probably a, a great question that you have a lot more experience on. Uh, I do certainly because the company is, is, is 126 years new, I hope we like to say. We, eliminate, if people saying we're 126, over 120 years old, we don't allow people to say that. We want to keep it new, but it is a constant commitment to reinvention. And, and I'll just, it, you have to reinvent the business model. Um, the minute there's a, an iota of arrogance, I think it would, or just even time and experience thinking that you've been doing it and it's been successful. I mean, kind of the minute you just slack off on that for one second, I think that's when you don't last 120 plus years. We have had to reinvent the company over and over again. Um, and I guess that starts with leaders. I mean, the leaders either have to reinvent themselves uh, because the companies don't reinvent themselves. It's people who do all the reinventing. It's, these, you know, it's all the people that work for the company and love the company that cause the revolution. But um, it, it is a very delicate balance keeping the founder's principle um, and the belief set that really define the culture in the company in the early days, keeping the best of it, but forcing the rest of it to change um, kind of cyclically, you know, and so even, in, I've been the CEO 10 years, which is in and of itself an interesting thought, so I'm celebrating my own first decade, um, and that's pr probably pretty unusual in these days, but one of the things that it forces you to do is to be a very different leader. I think I've had sort of three or four chapters myself, and the things that I'm doing now in some ways blow apart early strategies that I even put into place and I'm the ninth CEO of the company. So when you think about it that way, um, it's this forced march to constantly think of the company um, outside in. Uh, always think about, you know, who would destroy this model, who would come in and um, do this a very modern way and, you know, Facebook, Google, I mean, all, all the whole internet revolution has certainly challenged and put a lot of great dialogue around our executive conference rooms about you know, how do we keep an old company, if you would, very, very new, using technology. What's the, what's the purpose of high touch? We started off as how can we meld high touch with high tech and make it very modern? But you, know, you have to keep the values and the principles. You, you know, we still have the founder's portrait you know, in our boardroom. The values have stayed the same. The mission of empowering women has stayed the same. Just about everything else has changed. Uh, and will probably change again in the next five or six years. So that's pr pretty important. Great. So um, one of the things I found really interesting as I was reading more about Avon was how you're able to enable so much micro enterprise and how you have affiliates all over the world that are selling your products. And a lot of ways that's, there's some similarities to Google where Google has really tried to enable everyone to be able to become an advertiser, anyone to post video um, on the internet at YouTube, for example. And so um, maybe like, just for the audience, if you can talk maybe a little bit about those programs and... Um, no, I think that is a similarity. I mean, on one hand, you would probably think there couldn't be that much that's that similar between the two companies. But I think the, um, the social platform of anyone and everyone can join the company and change their lives. I mean, in our case, it's predominantly women. 96% of our sellers are women, but there are 6 million. Um, we just added a million people more than we had a year ago um, in the, the months of March and April, as you can imagine, uh, with the economy being the way it is. We've been very aggressive about recruiting, advertising, search engine marketing, just you know, need extra work, need a part-time job. I mean, we're there, that's what we want. To, you know, we used to really focus on skincare, anti-aging, lipstick, but now it's just completely, everybody who's coming into us is typing in, got laid off, need a job, and, um, and there, we, there we come up. And this has been extraordinary, and that has been a new revolution for us in and of itself. But 
essentially we're, I mean, you know, it's the whole Muhammad Yunus thing. We, we are the largest micro lender to women. If you join the company, you don't have to put anything up until you actually get paid by your customers. So in a sense, we're lending you and giving you your first micro loan if you join. And that uh, is happening all over the world to a tune of, a, you know, we have billion dollars uh, of loans out there all the time. And if you look, think about lending and lending to women right now, which with the bank freezes and the credit crisis, we also like to say that we are probably the largest lender of, to, to women on small business right now in this moment compared to any other company. So we're performing that as well as we are trying to be a cosmetic company. Um, and we have, let's see, the largest market in the world for us um, in terms of number of sellers is China. We have 1.1 um, million we call them sales promoters or independents, um, and that is growing by 40, 50,000 a month. The second largest sort of region in the world for us is um, Brazil. I, I would say the developing and emerging world, a million sellers. Um, Mexico, Poland, Russia, India now I think is going to be a next big frontier just because where the population of women are who want to earn. The U.S. is growing nicely right now in this economy, but it's about 600, 600,000 to give you an idea of how big the emerging markets are for us in terms of the earnings opportunities. So it's a network. They're 100% independent. They run their own businesses. Um, and we teach them now with e-tools as opposed to, we used to, if you came to Avon 15 years ago, you would go to a, a sales meeting. You would attend, somebody would be teaching you in a room like this in a hotel about new products, training, how to earn money. Uh, today you do it online. Pretty much everything has moved to the internet and that's allowed us to really, I guess, penetrate more fully, but they're all independent. Um, you can make, we have people who make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year if they're really serious about it. Um, and we have people who just make extra money when their kids are at school because they only want to do it part-time. So we're actually the largest sort of part-time flexible earnings opportunity for women. And our whole motto is you can't get laid off. <clears throat> you can't lose your job here. You make your own hours. You are your own CEO, your own boss. Um, so there's an egalitarian and very um, great social purpose in the business model. Wow. Yeah. Maybe we could do a partnership where they sell Sounds like advertising. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so, um, so we have a, probably a lot of engineers here or salespeople who work um, on growing Google. Um, how have you seen the internet change retail? And how have you seen the internet change Avon? I know you touched oh, on some of that. It's completely changed the company. I mean, we, we actually have uh, a direct site, so you can type in avon.com and order any product that you want. Um, it's, it's one of the largest actual beauty retail sites in terms of dollars, but compared to our $11 billion revenues, we probably do $70 million, which is not a small number in, in retail sales. But the line share, we made this decision, I guess, in 1999 to, to really web enable our, our sellers that, you know, we were worried about disintermediation. You probably all know that thought. Um, so we were, you know, we had a lot of people who were concerned that we would just own the customer's names, we would not uh, have a need anymore for our sales representatives and we would just go online with the business. Um, and notwithstanding the thought that um, even though, you, you know, if you have your 12 basic products, once you use them for reordering, et cetera, there's a tremendous amount of business done online, Skin So Soft, products like that. Trial, fragrance, sampling, shades, I mean, all of that, you know, we still believe that there's this combination of high tech plus high touch, which could really have a great economic business model where we had these independent sellers who were able to kind of, first of all, you don't have to pay to have products delivered. If you don't like the product or the shade, you don't have to pack it up and pay any shipping or delivery fee. Don't Just leave it there and somebody comes and picks it up from you from your desk, from your front door, wherever. Um, and we just really blended this model of, as I said, a combination of e-tools for the seller so she does all her business um, with the company online. She places her orders online now. I mean, when I started with the company, 48 page purchase order, number two pencil. You know, you have to circle in how many quantity of lipstick color X. And I mean, it really was a nightmare of a process. Today, that's all e-enabled. But I think more importantly, I mean, our store, our brochure is online. Um, all the population now of uh, her birthday, I mean, all the things that, that uh, obviously add to productivity, et cetera, it's completely it's been the game changer of our business. Interesting for me was outside the US, I mean, we were making, I think, an erroneous assumption 
that sort of the penetration of PCs to households would be how fast we could go. So one example was Turkey a few years ago where we got the data that said 15 or 17 percent of households or women were using computers. So it wasn't a market that we were targeting like we were targeting Japan, the UK, etc. Uh, but our people there decided that they were going to show us so as all good things happen outside of headquarters, they, they really incented all of their 250,000 independent sales representatives, of whom less than 10% actually had PCs, to um, do their business online, to go to cyber cafes, to uh, go to the library. And there was an economic incentive to do business, to place your order, and to do business online. In less than a year, 95% of our sellers were completely e-enabled um, and had e we had given, you know, gotten them an opportunity to get the hardware and we really believed that we could help women learn how um, basic computing skills would be not Im just important for their Avon business but important in life, important in educating their children or keeping up with kids. Um, and so we began on a march around the emerging and developing world where we thought that we could be a force for helping women understand the role of technology in their businesses as independent entrepreneurs, but also just, as I said, in their lives. So we really accelerated the rollout way beyond the markets that we had been already kind of 85% uh, of our people using, but they were the developed markets. And we switched our thinking, and uh, our people helped us realize we were wrong to kind of wait in terms of the time. So now just about every market uh, has an opportunity and most of our representatives are doing their business online. So it's completely changed the business model. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yes. It's interesting um, story there about headquarters versus the yes. different regions. Um, I think yes. that's something that we um, have here too yeah. because we have a lot of different international offices and then we have headquarters and so there's always this yep. for us trying to figure out how do we enable all of our offices to, yeah. to do the right thing. So that's a that's, I don't know how you handle that. Well, we have here. conversations all the time about, I'll call it just sort of global local, um, and trying, you know, we're a very entrepreneurial company, not dissimilar from you. I mean, so everything for us is, you know, about the, the sales rep agents, the independent sellers, and they don't work for us. I mean, they're, they, you know, there's not, they're not employees. We can't tell them what to do. Um, they, they make up their own minds, and uh, they'll stay with us. If they love the service and the applications and the and the promise and the brand, and they won't if they don't. Um, and so that's always been at the kind of culture uh, of of a grassroots company, if you would, with six plus million independent people. So you know when you kind of morph it all the way up into corporate headquarters over the years, we had actually probably one of the more decentralized companies where a lot of the ideas started from outside of the United States in the markets and we sort of had a lot of pride in being um, not corporate headquarters tells you what to do. It, we, we loved the thought that it was um, entrepreneurial and that sort of a thousand flowers blooming and all the good ideas would happen. That worked really well for us, so I don't know what, what will or won't apply to Google here, but for the first, I don't know how many years, but many, many years, it worked very well. I would say 100. For the first almost 100 years, until we got to, in our case, um, we grew to maybe $5 billion, um, $6 billion, and it worked extremely well. But when we decided to double in size in a very competitive marketplace, we realized that we needed to have platforms that could be run everywhere. We needed to have framework and policies and all the stuff I'm sure you all deal with. And you know, not 10 policies or 40 policies, but one policy. And uh, that obviously created a culture, a real cultural revolution in the company, trying to have headquarters, which is in New York in our case, um, disseminate uh, framework. We started calling it framework, you know, and we started saying best practice. Uh, and then we kept growing to a point as we doubled in size that we had to have a little bit more structure and organization. And now we are at a point where we're very careful, but we actually have corporate policies. Um, so whether it's private, uh, things that just, if it makes sense and there are laws that allow us to have global policies that would be true for commission policies, whatever it would be. Uh, th those have been the hard things, but those, those things have made a difference in the business. I mean, it's more efficient, keeps brand integrity, 
uh, more similar. We found that we were, you know, a thousand Avons. If you went to buy Avon from a product point of view, in our case, you could buy a fragrance. They were like, one day I had a meeting and I said I wanted a certain name of a fragrance. I put it on a table. There were 85 versions of the same fragrance. Well, this person in this country said the name didn't work. This person in this country said they don't like that color. This person in this country said, you know, the marketer said we don't, we don't like that smell. So we had a brand name that was supposed to have global equity that we were advertising that was actually 85 different versions. And so, you know, we said, well, time out. We, we, can't, we can't do that. Um, maybe we can't have one because there are varying consumer needs. So we did a lot of research. Um, didn't have the use of the internet at the time in those days yet to get the kind of massive research we could today, which we use now. But found three consumer type differences, found enough similarities with some options. So, you know, a fragrance like that might have two or three options now, depending on what Asian needs are or Latin American needs. But that has been a real process of balance between what's global or corporate and what's local. We don't call it corporate, we call it global, but that means to some people. Oh no, <laughs> Avenue of the Americas is coming to a theater near us. So, yeah. No, so there's a, that's a there's some Similar. really good and important lessons there. Um, one of the things I noticed looking at your website was that you have a section on your website called corporate responsibility. Yeah. And um, so then I looked at that page and I saw a couple of really interesting press releases. So the first was the seventh annual Avon Walk for Breast Cancer. Uh, in Boston raises over 5.6 million and then the second one about speak out against domestic violence short film contest to launch at con um, and I, so those were just the things that were on there as of today um, so I thought maybe if you could talk a little bit about sure. um, corporate responsibility and what that means for Avon and how you enable that among your well I, I am uh, you know pretty passionate about the fact that you know as a company especially for us being so steeped in tradition on one hand. Um, uh, we had a tradition even early on about giving back to the community, so we've sort of taken that founding principle and, and kept it alive. But, you know, we believe a lot in performance, philanthropy, and sustainability, and uh, we established 50 years ago an actual 501c foundation, the Avon Foundation, and we wanted to keep it sort of tight to the company for women, so it's the largest women's foundation, corporate foundation. Uh, we've raised I, I believe almost $700 million. Um, most of it over the first 10 years was to uh, aid in the fight against breast cancer. So we, we actually raise through walks, whether it's in Boston, it's 11 cities, um, and it's not only our sellers, but it's just, it's communities, it's women in the community who, who join and, and walk and raise money towards um, the breast cancer causes and, and they're very community oriented. I mean we actually give back and if we have a walk in Boston it goes back to Mass General or Dana-Farber or a, a hospital in that community. It usually goes back to the underserved and underprivileged in other words in, in addition to funding research we give access and care to people who do not have insurance so um, Manhattan, when we, we've raised probably 10, 12 million dollars every season and we donate, but we don't do it to, you know, Memorial Sloan Kettering, for example, is a phenomenal hospital, a cancer hospital, but we, we've established a center up at Columbia where um, it really services up in Harlem and up in the Bronx where women can come get a mammogram and if diagnosed can get treatment, uh, even if they don't have medical insurance. And so we believe very much on, on the underserved. So that's been a line share. And this came from our people. Um, you know, again, we try and do things bottoms up. So we asked our associates and we asked all of our independent sellers years ago, what's the one cause you want to get involved in instead of, instead of being top down? And they said women's health and specifically breast cancer because one in eight women around the world is still dying. Then we actually got so successful um, and it became such a prideful thing for our associates and our sellers that um, they came to us and said we want to take on education as well as women's rights and women's, um, women's issues beyond health. Uh, and so again, coming sort of from grassroots desire to take on domestic violence, sexual slavery, I mean, and, and again really help in women's rights, we've taken on a second set of initiatives and we've partnered with the UN and the company is raising money and having spokespeople talk about, uh, particularly in the developing and emerging world, as you can imagine, issues of women's rights. Uh, we've partnered with um, the legal system because there are countries where there are, quote, women's laws, women's rights laws in effect, but they're not 
you know, they're, they're not kept to and, and people are not uh, being, they aren't in, being enforced because in many cases, you know, the, the, there are male legislators, et cetera. So we've been pretty active on that front too. And so we'll take sort of the vision of the company um, being for women for, to make money if you want to sell, consumers if you want to buy, associates, I think we have more women in management than any other company, um, and then the last piece is in the community for women in the community on issues of health education and violence. We also kind of try and make it a 360 degree social purpose. It's very impressive, so thank you. Um, well, I'm gonna, probably going to ask about one or two more questions, and then I'd love to hear um, questions. I'm sure a lot of you have questions um, for Andrea. But I thought maybe we could just talk a little bit about your leadership style um, and what you've learned in being a CEO for 10 years, which is a really long, pretty long time. Um, sort of how has your leadership style evolved, and what have you learned as being a CEO for 10 years? Well, I'll, I'll just tell you a, a, a fast story. Um, that I actually was passed over to become the CEO in 1997. Um, there were uh, a few of us uh, that were in the company for a while and uh, at that time the CEO was retiring and business got very tough and you know the stock price fell and you know there were all kinds of macro challenges and so while I had sort of been I guess you would call it favored to be the next CEO. Uh, they had made a decision at that time to sort of switch gears and they actually put in uh, someone who had been on the board, uh, a, a gentleman who had been a CEO of a company at that time. And um, he was much older than I was, he had the quote experience. And so it was um, written up actually in the New York Times and uh, in the journal because it was in that era where I believe there was probably there was one or two maybe other women in the Fortune 500 leading companies. And so the headline was sort of, you know, there's still a glass ceiling, woman passed over at the top at Avon. And at that time, I actually had a mentor who said to me, um, because what happened with all this press that I was passed over is that I got offers to be the CEO of several other companies. And I had a moment in my life at that time where sort of taking the job for the title and everything that came with it, or sort of staying with Avon, that was my fork in the road. And I had a mentor who said to me, you know, follow your compass, not your clock. You know, basically, don't let your head make this decision. Make, let your heart make this decision. And that was one of the inflection points of my, my life, let alone my business life. I thought about it long and hard, and I, I decided, you know, I never really actually came into this to be the CEO. I love the company. I mean, I've had a, a great opportunity. But would I rather be number two at a company that, I mean, I just, I, I think you can hear I am passionate about what we do, that I really believe in what the company does. I really believe, and I, I love the work. I don't love every day. I haven't loved every boss, but I, I, love, I love the work. And I, I, I really like the people and what this company's all about. Or do I want to be for a brand or a company that it's, it's good. I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to have the same passion for it. But I'll have the title and the salary and everything that comes with it. And right there I just decided, you know what, I, I'd rather be number two at a company I love than be number one at a company or a business that really wasn't as much of my passion. And he was 52. So it wasn't like he was 63 and they were saying, just do this for two years and then you'll become the CEO. I mean, I, I was signing up, sort of past that opportunity up. And I, I, I never looked back. I thought, you know what, I, I, that's it. I, I love the company. So I did that. Now the rest is history because he didn't succeed. He really didn't have a feel for it. And so 18 months later, he hadn't turned the business around and the board made the decision and gave me the job. And, you know, have now been in the job 10 years and I've had what seemed like an uninterrupted, if you read the papers or the magazines, it, I don't know if they tell you that piece of it, but probably looks like I had this linear career rise, which wasn't true. I don't think it's true for any of us. And I, I would tell you that if I had to make that decision again, even if he succeeded, I'd still make that decision. That may sound crazy to you now because now, you know, I'm on fortune's list and blah, 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 but I, I would make the decision again because 
I mean, you're all, I'm sure, living in this world today, the same that I lived in. I had lots of friends uh, from, of mine who graduated from Princeton who, they had great jobs, but they never stayed with it because they didn't, they didn't love it. They went to Wall Street, they didn't love it. It was a job, maybe it was a career, but it was never a passion. And I guess my answer to the question of, you know, why do you think you're successful? I mean, all of the things have to be equal, I guess, but I love it. I love my, I love my work. There's a tremendous amount of sacrifice that comes with it. There always is, you know, I, I'm a mom, I can talk about that in a minute, but just, it doesn't really matter. Woman, man, it's the same for all of us. There's sacrifice that comes with it, and not every day is great, trust me, but I, I love the company, and I love the work, and I, I think that passion for the work is the definer at the end of the day. You know, it's, what, it, it's why I can do this 10 years later and still feel excited about it. Um, and people who had what I thought were better jobs in different bigger companies, they are not working now or they're not happy now, one or the other. And life's too short for that. So my philosophy has always been love what you do. I mean, fall in love and have a love affair with the company and your job. Um, and like I said, I have had terrible situations throughout, meaning hated my boss or hated certain days or certain roles, but I never, I never didn't love the company or um, the purpose of what I was doing. So that, that, that's my one piece of advice. I think a great piece of advice for everyone. So I have to ask, uh, hearing yes. the story, so how did you turn it around? How did I turn it around? Well, I think you have to have a real blend. I mean, they always talk about you have to be strategic and operational, and it sounds like a textbook of all these business books. And there's books written on execution, and there's books written on vision. But there, there is a truth to that. I think you have to be able to, as I say, if there's a go up and go down. Um, and if you can't go up or down and you just stay in the middle, you won't succeed. And what do I mean by that? I mean, there are times where you have to fly high. I mean, you have to have vision. I mean, it's, you know, for us in a 120-year-old company, when I came to the company, people handed me this huge book of um, research that basically said, Ding Dong, Avon Calling, Grandmother's Brand, in Spanish, the translation was um, brand for my maid. In, uh, I can't remember, in, in Germany, I think the, it said so cheap it can't possibly be good. So, I mean, it was like a tome of research that basically just said this is really dated, has been over brand. And um, so you had to kind of come at it eyes fresh and say, well, that's fine, but if I started a company called Andrea today, I mean, nobody would know it. And every single person, I mean, one out of two women have used an Avon product and or know Avon, so you're already walking in with an equity even though it's got a tarnish on it. So the first thing was complete brand reinvention, which is a lot of fun. Um, and you get, I mean, it is very fun to be a turnaround person, a meaning, and luckily you all don't have to do that yet because you're still <laughs> building a great thing, but at some point, uh, Google too will need to think of how it has to reinvent uh, or turn around a situation, a division, a product category, you know, a, a space that, that's somehow lost competitiveness, and that is a, an experience unto itself. Mm -hmm. But um, you have to have passion about it, and you have to believe that any brand can be turned around which I believe, if you do the right things, that consumers, um, they just want innovation, they want great product, and in our case, there was no negative equity, lots of trust, just dated. So we did an overhaul. We threw out 80% of the line. Um, we invested in research development. I mean, today we've got Reese Witherspoon, Patrick Dempsey, I mean, spokespeople who people would not associate with Avon, um, you couldn't do that until the product was right. I mean, why have Patrick Dempsey and Reese Witherspoon if the product is dated? But complete new packaging, you know, everything from scratch, and uh, that was a, a long journey, but a successful one. So that was the brand. The second was the channel, ding dong, Avon calling, no one's at home anymore, no one wants direct sales, it's pushy, it's got negative stigma. Um, so I guess two things, one is, we think we've made it really pretty hip. Uh, we advertised on the Super Bowl, except we were the only company that didn't advert, or one of the few that didn't advertise a product. Everyone was expecting us to advertise lipstick, and we advertised five pretty hip, cool women who lost their jobs 
and, and, and since November who basically said why they joined Avon, why this was going to work for them, and how they were going to make ends meet and pay this mortgage off by doing it. Uh, we had thousands and thousands of calls and hits in the, before the first quarter of the game was over, um, and it's usually a male venue. So that began this incredible um, sort of turnaround of, hey, this is cool. It's cool to, to kind of be your own boss and run your own business, and then the internet was the second revolution. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have high-tech experience, it wouldn't have been able to be turned around. Mm -hmm. So that was a nice collision. Mm -hmm. And the third thing was, I mean, we had to be grown up and start doing things like layoffs and cost cutting and all the stuff that you just want to go, ah, oh, I don't want a business, I'm a growth company. And uh, we had to get disciplined to put in what I call you know, a constant efficiency for us systems. We had all kinds of different platforms. We had to do our own version of SAP. We had to completely transform the back of the house to keep up with the front of the house, which was not easy. Um, and so those were the tough things. Mm -hmm. Had to do the tough calls too. The other part was the fun part. Um, we had to delayer our management. We had built all these layers. It happens when, you know, we just end up we were growing so fast we had all these international regions so we had layers of management and um, we just said we got we're not close enough to the customer anymore we're not close enough to our seller we've got to take out half of our layers of management and we did that in three months which was really horrendous very difficult I had been there so long I knew everybody I had hired everybody I had promoted everybody so that was very, very difficult, but necessary to get back to close, fast decisions. You know, People were saying, Andrea, do you realize now there's so many layers that when you ask for something, it can take this many months to get up the food chain and then to go back up, down the food chain with an answer, layers just mean time. And it's, it's a world where lots of companies had to just kind of eliminate that thought. So we had to um, have the process and the discipline because we were very entrepreneurial to put in sort of the structure and the cost effectiveness programs that we weren't used to as a company because we had always been growing so fast. And that, that was um, a healthy thing to learn because when we came into this economic recession, we were ready for it, if you're, if you're tracking with me. I mean, we had kind of hit the wall and built up too much cost in 05. And so we got so trained at how to do that that when we came into this, it was fast. And I think we've been able to kind of weather through and it's not so much of a, you know, moment for our company because we went through it a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think there's some really so, good lessons good. there. We've good. had, um, we've certainly been a growth company for, for a while. I mean, it is some point, only fun to be a growth company, yeah. right? But um, in order to be a growth company, yeah. if you don't, and you realize, I realized it, I learned the hard way, that if you don't constantly take out those ineffective Right. Less productive costs so that you can continue to fuel the growth. It's just too, too competitive out there. And, yeah. um, you know, when you think about lessons learned, that's lessons learned for me were that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't, you know, I, I just didn't cut the costs fast enough because we were still growing. Mm -hmm. Didn't fix the roof when the sun was shining. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, the people, you know, the people tell you about that and you read about it. But when you're growing, when we were growing double digits, 25% earnings growth a year, the first five years that I was a CEO, I mean, we just couldn't, we just kept minting money. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then when it, when it stops or when it halts or slows, it slows, I will tell you one thing, it always slows faster than you think. I mean, it, you know, people say, well, it can't come to a grinding halt. Guess what? It can. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to that grinding halt and you haven't taken up the cost, then it's really ugly and really painful. And when you've sort of prepared yourself along the way in this sort of sustainable formula, it's a lot easier this mm -hmm. time around. Mm -hmm. So, good. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Well, I'm sure there are a lot of questions from people, so if anyone has questions, if you, want, you guys want to come to the mic and... and ask a question. Hi, can you hear me? Mm, one thing is... Um... Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hi. So my, hi. Hi. my question was, um, is there any other businesswoman who inspired you? Uh, like, for example, I know in France, all our, not all, but most our businesswomen, they, they inspired to be like Coco Chanel of Chanel. But is there someone like that that uh, inspired you? That's a great question. Businesswomen that inspired me. Well, I, I am a, I, I 
I, I think Coco Chanel was just so ahead of her time and uh, was a true, if, if you could define who had vision for brand um, and passion for brand, she certainly was one. I've had, um, I, I think, a combination of, of, I guess, political figures um, and uh, fashion figures and, and business women who inspire me for all kinds of different reasons. I, I think you always learn from elements from, from, from different people. There are different aspects of people that, that are uh, always great inspiration. So. So how is uh, Avon leveraging social networking sites and, and products, since you really are about, most of your sales has been through networks, friends? Yes, well, I mean, that is a, a, one of the most, I think, aggressive things that we're trying to do now is really leverage that. We actually have a, a brand that's, um, we launched in 2007, which is for sort of, our, our goal was to recreate Avon, but for the next generation. So it's called Mark, meaning kind of make your mark. Um, and it's not Avon, it's, it's by Avon, but it essentially is targeting, I'll just call it 18 to 28 year olds. Um, and it's basically all online. We have a lot of um, alliances with Facebook and with MySpace in terms of just trying to get women uh, college and older to be involved in beauty um, and, and, and social networking. And so we call it social beauty. Our version is, is social beauty and the thought is really the following. I mean, we started and did, did a pretty interesting job on college campuses. Um, it's grown from there and we actually have a lot of users who are older than college, but we basically said, well, why, why work a job at college? And so we literally said, you know, you can work in the cafeteria and or you know, at the library and you're gonna make X dollars, you have to work this many hours. Or you can basically have five friends over to your room, um, you know, serve drinks. If they buy three pieces of makeup each, you can pay your phone bill, your ex, your wife for the same amount of time. You only have to do this once for two hours every two weeks and it'll make the exact same money. So we really went on this big uh, push and this, this was done over you know, hundreds of college campuses and so we're trying to penetrate a different seller who doesn't want anything to do with an Avon lady. I mean, you know, if you ask her, she'll say, you know, that, that, that's not, even with the work I think we've done, she doesn't want to win a cruise to Alaska. You know, she wants MTV <laughs> tickets or an I, but yeah, no desire to have any of the, uh, the benefit streams that come in the system that we designed for the mother brands. So in this, we've really tried to uh, develop an arrangement and, and an opportunity to really be on social networks and to have people use social networks to help them run their business. Do you have a Do you question? Do you want to introduce okay. yourself and say what you do? Sure. Actually, as you guys come up and ask questions. I know you all, but. <laughs> um, Andrea, I'm Pooja Jaspal. I am an HR business partner. I work actually with Susan and with Marissa Meyer and others. Um, uh, my question is around, how do you run your days? So operationally, like what do you do in the morning? What's your routine like to you know, stay on top of trends, to keep whole, keep balanced? You hear of CEOs meditating. Um, you know, how, do you, how do you run your, run your days? How I run my days? Well, I think they're not exactly a daily routine because I travel a lot. So let me just start with Avon's business. Um, only 25% of our business is done here. 75% of our business is done around the world. So I am on a plane a lot and in the developing and emerging markets. And I actually am probably at extraordinarily, terribly proficient at um, the shortest amount of time you know, on land <laughs> to do the business, get back on the plane, go to another country and then come home. So a lot of times I'm on flying through the night from one place to another so I can clock, clock most number of nights home for my kids. But um, when I am home, I, I try to do the following. I mean, I, I exercise, I do aerobics and or yoga early in the morning. I hate mornings, but I do them at 5.30 because it always falls off the wayside. I have always got these great intentions, so I am an absolute non-morning person, but I would say, well, I work out two or three times a week after work. 
and something inevitably would come up. And so, and, and even you know, when I got into a point where I could have a trainer or whatever, they'd be like, we're dropping you. You are like the worst client. You <laughs> never show up. You are history. So now I force myself to do it because the only time I have no excuse, nobody's up, there's absolutely no excuse except myself, is at the most ungodly hour for me, which is 5.30 in the morning. I do that several days a week. I try, um, I take my children to work and I try not to have meetings uh, until like 9.30 because in the most productive hour and a half at work for me is, because uh, once it starts, it never stops. And if I don't schedule that time, I'm in a disaster crisis mode all, you know, 24-7. So I try and have just think time and or, um, you know, organization time in the morning. I um, rarely eat lunch except running through my, at my desk or just kind of running through the company cafeteria. Um, but I'm, I, I like to spend time during the week just sort of going, if I'm in New York, just going in, dropping in on meetings. For me, it's always about the sort of unplanned as opposed to planned meetings that are most productive. I mean, I try and just ask my people to give me a list of where, where they're meeting their teams. And, and uh, people kind of look at me, but I just drop in sometimes and either uh, hopefully don't uh, <laughs> stop the conversation and the, and the free thinking, but it gives me a, a better idea of what's going on in the company. I like to have our Avon representatives into our offices, so I will call and visit and or have some of our representatives come and just tell me, without any agenda, tell me the bad stuff, I know the good stuff. Tell me five horrible things, five reasons you want to quit this month. Tell me, you know, tell me how bad our service was, what was the worst product experience you had, because um, then you're really getting it unfiltered and fresh. Um, and so those are the things that I, I try and do when I'm not traveling. When I travel, um, you know, it's a combination of government visits, seeing our representatives, trying to get out in the field, having panels of, of people who can kind of tell me. I like to hear the bad things, as I said, that are going on, uh, as well as business reviews. So that's, that's pretty much my day. Hi, my name is Becky. I'm actually uh, an intern here for the Hi. summer on the external communications and product marketing team. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little more toward being a woman in the business industry, specifically for someone my age who's just embarking on a career and being in that you know, business arena, some of the challenges you've Well, I think that it's a great thing that when I look at you going into business compared to when I started, I think the world has changed. I mean, it's not 100% perfect, um, but I, I would just say to you that the glass is more than half full um, in, in terms of, uh, when I was even in middle management, women were more in, I'll just call them staff roles, you know, I mean, the, the concept of women running, running the operations as opposed to, um, you know, some of the other jobs in the company was not there, and today it's amazing. I think how many women, even though there aren't, aren't huge numbers of women CEOs still yet, a lot more, but not huge, the, the number of women in sort of the number two and three positions that could take that job is probably 30-fold what it was even five years ago. So I think the next five years is gonna look very different than the last five, and I think um, for your generation, it's gonna be terrific. I, I'm a even playing field person, though, I mean, sometimes, People will say to me, well, so now at Avon, and we're the company for women, you know, is it always going to be a woman CEO? Do you think you've had an advantage? And with the exception of the fact that I, you know, I use the product, and if there's a product that I don't like, you know, I suppose the male CEOs never got to tell, I'll, I'll call the lab up and go, this is really horrible. <laughs> what were we thinking? Which would take a longer time with somebody else. But I, I believe that the next CEO could be a man as well as it could be a woman. I just think it should be an even playing field. Not a tilted playing field, but an even playing field. And I, I think business is that way today. I think it's better when there are m women and men around the table in a dialogue. Um, I think that we do come around things a different way. Not a better way, not a worse way, just, just a different way. And so an approach to a decision, um, a process. I always find it very interesting how the blend of you know, an equal number of men and women around a, a table makes for a better answer. And that's been true for me, whether it's a boardroom or, or a business meeting. So I think even playing field is my, my answer, and I think it is one today, which is great. 
Hi, Andrea. My name is Roxanne. Hi. Um, I work in online advertising with our AdWords product. Um, I have two questions, actually. The first one um, is about finding your passion. Yeah. Uh, so you studied at Princeton and I think majored in English literature. How did you? How and when did you decide that you wanted to work in the beauty uh, retail industry? Well, I actually was going to. I thought I wanted to be a journalist, <laughs> and I was actually going to go back to school for journalism. And I decided, though, that I wanted to just take two years off before I went back to school. And so I had two friends who um, are sons of Don Fisher at The Gap, who went to Princeton, who went, had gone to retail training program before they both eventually went back and ran uh, or part of the, the company. And right back here in San Francisco. And so they said, oh, you know, retail is a really great opportunity if you want to just get, kind of get that everyday pulse in those days. I mean, again, no internet at that time, this kind of degree. But if you want to get a real pulse on a daily basis as opposed to another, on, on terms of your own success, in terms of the consumer and what he or she wants, it's just a great training program. So I went with the complete thought that I would leave. I, I, I really had no intention of staying in marketing or retailing. I thought I was going to use my English major to something more lofty. And I never left because it just, it really got into my blood um, in terms of just being out there with the consumer. Um, so it wasn't so much cosmetics. And then I, I had a career in retailing um, before I came to Avon. And the last thing I did was obviously marketing and merchandising, including cosmetics. So it was uh, an unplanned, unplanned, unintended career. But I did fall in love with it. Okay. Um, so my second question, there aren't a lot of female CEOs, let alone Asian American female CEOs. What, what do you think have, have been the key factors in your success? Well, I think that maybe some of you will relate to this that I'm speaking to, but I, I grew up in a pretty traditional Asian family. And um, one of my stories that you'll laugh at is that actually the first, when I became a CEO, uh, the, Dan Rather did a TV series with myself, Carly Fiorina at the time, and um, Jill Barad, who was at, at Mattel years and years ago. They were, we were the only three, I guess, female CEOs, and they went to interview families. And so their thing was they were going to talk to mothers and fathers and do interviews at home. So my mother cooked Peking duck. <laughs> but they basically asked, why did you think your daughter would always be successful, or how did you know your you know, daughter would become a CEO? And, and uh, they filmed for hours, and the one snippet that they actually aired, which is the way these things always go, 20 seconds after hours, was my father saying, well, I raised her as a very traditional you know, Chinese daughter. I, I can't imagine that she's actually going to be that successful in this, because my vision of CEOs, I mean, she's so far from that. I mean, she's not, <laughs> she's not confrontational. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, that she does not seem like a typical CEO whatsoever to me. I'm like, ah, this is national TV. <laughs> But I guess the truth in that is the truth in that, which is that I, um, I have never changed who I am. I mean, I can look at all of you and say, but I have, I have definitely become more assertive. I mean, I, I, I'm not aggressive. I don't think people would say, she's really aggressive. But people would not say that I lack assertiveness, which they would have said when I started off in my career. I mean, I grew up at a dinner table where, I mean, you know, arguing about something, just that was not good. I mean, you just didn't argue. I mean, that was just, you know, anti-cultural. And so the concept of constructive confrontation, getting your point of view out there, sort of taking the lead on that, it was really difficult for me when I started off. And um, I mean, I can tell you that it, it, is, it really was kind of critical to have that, I'll call it Western versus you know, Eastern aspect, and still feel like I've really never had to change who I was. But I, I'm much better at that now. I mean, I, I have um, a lot of young Asian American associates that work for us, and at a table, I'll have to draw. I mean, I'm I'm good at drawing them out. I'll say, you know, I, I know you have a point of view about that. Why don't you? I can see. I know. But no, no good telling me later, or you know, and I'm sure it's smart thinking. Tell me now. But it it does take um, that. I guess two things, courage and perseverance to um, find a style that works, that, um, 
that your voice can be heard without feeling like you're over boasting or too much in the limelight or something that just doesn't feel natural. But I will say to you that growing up, you know, in a Chinese household, I remember my very first job, which had nothing to do with um, the business it was in, but it, I remember I was, I had had this Ivy League education. I was literally changing hangers in a stock room from the vendor hangers to the store hangers day in and day out. And I thought this is a really wa big waste of time. And everybody else in the training program was quitting. So I called my, my house and my mom said to me, we don't quit. Chinese don't quit. I mean, you're not quitting. Are you kidding? You've got a job. You're going to work that job. You're not quitting like everybody else. And I thought, okay. But from that, I, 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 I didn't quit. And pretty shortly after, I got promoted to be an assistant buyer. And then, you know, the rest of it started from there. But I, I almost quit. And um, that thought of sort of persevering and just, you know, stay the course when everybody else was flitting off to do something else was an inflection point early on in my career that, that, that really made a difference. So, okay. Great, those were some really, some really good stories. Thank you all um, very and much. And I've learned a lot um, from hearing. I think it's, it's, always, um, it's always really wonderful to hear other people's stories good. and learn from them. And I want to thank you for taking the time. Thank you everybody. And if everyone good luck. can give Andrea a big hand company. for coming. Thank, thank you. you.